Qualitative research reports often state that transcription occurred verbatim. Is this ever strictly true? Can verbatim transcription occur? Do these assertions make sense? Hello, my name is Martin Lipscomb, and I'm joined by Professor Emeritus Susan Tilley of Brock University's Department of Educational Studies. Dr. Tilly is author of, among much else, Challenging Research Practices, Turning a Critical Lens on the Work of Transcription. And this excellent paper that appeared several years ago in the Journal of Qualitative Inquiry advances a series of interesting and important observations on the subject of transcription and education. Susan, thank you for joining me, please. Would you outline the argument of your paper? Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, as you know, transcription is very much uh, at the center of my interest in qualitative research. And um, this paper specifically looks at transcription in relation to focus group research yep. and focus group interviewing. So I, I would say uh, there are special things related to that are, that are very articulated in the paper. I'm interested in general uh, in educating and learning myself more about transcription as a very complex process that is very much a part of uh, the research process. I'm talking from the perspective of a qualitative researcher within the interpretivist paradigm. And that makes a difference. I'm not coming as a quantitative researcher from the positivist paradigm. So how we think about interviewing is influenced by our paradigm and then also in terms of our methodology. So it's hard to talk about transcription in isolation as part of a method of interviewing. So I'll talk more generally. So one of my concerns is the assumptions that are brought to the table whenever we're thinking about transcription. Transcription is often an afterthought of a research design. Like students are not, um, are not basically thinking about transcription when they're actually deciding what their research focus is or designing their research. And I think that that's problematic because it needs to be considered in relation to the purpose of your research. So you will transcribe in a particular kind of way based on the purpose of your research. So if you're looking at linguistic question, you're gonna do a different kind of transcript and analysis than if you're looking at content analysis and more of um, a focus on understanding meaning of experience. So, so I'm really talking about educational research, and I've taught nursing students quite a bit in my educational qualitative research class. So I have some affinity for that. So um, it's educational research and often the educational focus and question is qualitative, even though for decades we've been focused on more positivist and quantitative research in schooling contexts. So it is more qualitative. So you have to bring those assumptions about the objective transcriber. So as a person transcribing, I will be totally objective. That's an impossibility if you're within the interpretist paradigm. So we're already starting off on the wrong foot if we're doing qualitative research and we're thinking about uh, transcription and the objective transcriber, person transcribing. The other that, thing is- that's, that, that's really interesting. Could you just say a little bit more about that? Um, yeah. About the assumption of objectivity? Yes. So um, for me, uh, I, I think of this continuum in terms of methodology. And so when we shift it more in an acceptance of qualitative methodologies, there's a huge literature out there and a huge number of practices and paradigms and things. Um, we often stay too attached, like there's this continuum. And over on this end, you have, and I do right and left, which is interesting, but you have the quantitative research. You have quantitative research. You move from, on the left quantitative, you move towards qualitative, but we're often stuck here, working within a positivist framework, thinking things about uh, there is a reality we can capture, that there's one meaning, that uh, objectivity is our goal 
the same with I want to prove a hypothesis. In qualitative work that continues on, when you're more in the qualitative interpretist paradigm, you're trying to understand meaning. And that's a very different perspective than proving a hypothesis. There is, of course, lots of research that needs to be quantitative, but as a qualitative researcher, I try and talk to students about this shift. You, you can't bring your positivist thinking into the interpretivist paradigm because it affects what you do. So if you think about transcription, that I'm going to transcribe verbatim. So by putting everything I hear into this text, I've actually taken the language that I heard and plotted it on paper that I've captured some reality. We're dismissing the interpretive, the interpretive nature of the whole task of listening and then the analysis and theory that informs how we move into that text. So it's the assumption is it's a mundane text. I'm just going to listen to this tape and I'm just going to write what I hear. And it's much more complex than that. So we have to first start looking at, is it a mundane task within a qualitative paradigm? It may be a mundane task, if it's a structured interview, you had your questions that you couldn't deviate from as very positivist structured interview, then maybe you can copy exactly what was said because even the questions asked were already decided before you entered the interview context. So maybe a little verbatim is possible over here, but not when you're really in inside the interpreter's paradigm, open-ended, in-depth interviews where you're trying to provide the opportunity for participants to explore their experiences. So your transcript is gonna reflect the type of interview and your positioning within your theory, within your, even your philosophical positioning, what you believe, those kinds of things. Because analysis starts or is already underway by the time yes. you come to transcribe and part of attributing meaning or finding meaning or however you want to describe that thing involves interpreting the pauses the ums the ahs mm -hmm. the grunts the, mm -hmm. sometimes the body language or whatever it's not just writing out the words as if it was that simple is that correct yes and the problem is there's a deep belief in the fact that in order to capture the truth we would have to capture those things that you just described. Whereas in some circumstance, when you actually transcribe verbatim, you interfere with the meaning and capturing the truth of the, what the participant wanted to say. So for instance, when you insert meaningless ohs, ahs, ums, it's so choppy what you get in that text that it can confuse the meaning. And we haven't discussed that much at all. So there's some, the assumption is verbatim text is the best and the most truthful. The other assumption is we have to have a polished text. So we're assuming that the language, the spoken language translates, translates into written language one-to-one. -one. That's not the case. Speaking is not the same as writing. So, and the meaning intended comes out in different ways. So, so for me, the biggest problem is many people are doing qualitative research without any background knowledge of the methodologies and what they're focused on is method. You can't look at method divorced from methodology. Your method is connected to the criteria of your methodology, your paradigm. Uh, the actual, if you're choosing a specific qualitative research tradition, like case study, ethnography, that kind of thing. Uh, but we're teaching often, we even call our courses qualitative methods. And we divorce it from the underpinnings that are, so I will choose a method because of my methodology. It has to fit. It can't be so interview. If I'm going to choose interviewing as a process for my data collection and education and nursing students, 
often interviews are their primary data. That's their study, interviews. So can you imagine you have the primary data and never has there been a discussion about transcription and you're claiming this to be credible data? Um, would it be putting words into your mouth or would I be um, misinterpreting you if I also took from what you were saying a criticism of the idea that research is the application of a process or a method um, in some staged way, whereas actually the process, the structure is there to help you think, but actually the research is really the thinking around the, the whole issue that you're looking at. Yes, it's really, so when you ask me to talk about transcription, it's yep. really difficult because I'm very much into, so theoretically, so as a researcher and students sometimes think of theory as big T theory, the theory out there, not recognizing that they have their own theories that are engaged when they're looking at what they're doing and when they're transcribing and everything. Like they're not a theoretical ever, even if they don't recognize it in their study, they don't have a theoretical framework in their study or something, uh, but it informs them. What they believe about knowledge will inform how did they do transcription. So if they believe verbatim is capturing truth, they're gonna go verbatim regardless of whether it's the best fit for the purpose of the research or for the actual methodology that they've chosen. So it's really about, it's very intricate from the forming of your research questions. You know, you, you, you have to think about why am I asking this question? Why is it important to do research, et cetera, et cetera. And that will connect to why do I choose interviews as my method. And then you have to go, if it's interviews, how am I gonna do credible interviews? What, what are the processes that are important in interviewing? And transcription is huge in that, but understudied, under-recognized and misunderstood, I would say. I see, I, I slightly, I, 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 I think that the, the problem of transcription isn't given due weight, but mm -hmm. My my reading is that lots of people have pointed to some of the obvious problems here. It's just we choose to ignore those things. So yes. how do you how do you translate um, dialect? Um, mm -hmm. What do you do with the pauses, the ums, the ahs, the not speaking in sentences? People don't speak in sentences or very long sentences, mm -hmm. or it's not how we write. And and the process of moving from uh, a conversation to a written output i think it's covered really well um amongst um well people um, um making sense of ancient texts they engage with this really well and you couldn't pick up a a book which is um re reproduces ancient text without there being a long introduction explaining the problem of that thing Obviously, we're not necessarily doing with ancient texts, but many of those problems are still there. So I'm not yes. disagreeing with you. It's just, I yeah. think we just ignore this issue. Yeah. Well, actually, what I would say is uh, you're pointing out um, when you go back to ancient texts, so you go back to looking at language. In linguistics, in discourse analysis, in those areas, transcription has been taken up, but that's where it's stayed. When I started to do this work, I actually did it when I started my interest in methodology and transcription when I was a PhD student. And my supervisor had me do a series of interviews, actually looking at women in academia and things. And then she told me to give the, the, the tapes to someone, the secretary, to transcribe. So I asked her and myself, well, what does that mean? I'm the one who did the interviews. A secretary is going to transcribe them without the theoretical methodological interest or knowledge. And then you have the researcher who's going to base their analysis on that. So you're actually three degrees divorced. So number one is another assumption that the interview tape is raw data. It's your primary data. It's not, it's not data. The raw data is the actual conversation 
it's already removed once you've taped it. Do you understand? So you're going a level. Then you had someone who did the interviews interpret, have their theoretical frame fingerprint on it. And then it goes to a transcriber. Then it goes to the researcher. So you're that far distanced from the raw data by the time you're analyzing it. And that's hugely problematic for me. So I talk in my work about a distance dynamic that works against credibility. And you can see, you know, professor, researchers, big, we have big grants just like you do in England. And oh my heavens, you got a million people working on the project. You have someone who goes to another country, doesn't speak the language, do, hire someone who's, uh, you know, proficient in the, the dominant language. You go to a small culture, you get an indigenous person who speaks a local language. Oh my heavens, now you're, how many moves re remove when you're doing your analysis from the primary data? So I'm not saying that that should never happen. What I'm actually saying that researchers, novice and professional researchers and you know very um, experienced researchers have to begin acknowledging, especially in educational research, nursing research, social sciences, where you're trying to understand your participants' experiences, you have to understand what it means to take that conversation and analyze it when it's two degrees distance from the actual conversation. You need to understand. And then you work against the things that will interfere. And there are ways of doing that, which, you know, it are, are, I made some suggestions in that paper, but I've written a series of three on transcription. Um, but there are ways, but students have to be educated, but we have to be educated too. Like there are lots of researchers. I mean, I see a lot of researchers claiming mixed method and they, and then I look at what mixed method means, and it means they did a survey with two open-ended questions at the end, and I want to screen. That's not qualitative. Like, <laughs> anyway, that's off topic. Okay. So uh, this is really interesting because I thought when we started talking that we'd focus on the nuts and bolts of of the problem of transcription, but you've you've raised it to a different level you're suggesting that you can't even look at transcription outside of the entire framework yes. of the research that you're doing um yes. okay that's really interesting thank you yeah yeah now the nuts and bolts uh there's lots about nuts and bolts and uh you know i make suggestions for students how how to do it as well as they can yep. uh and the first is to question those assumptions that they start with and you know not assume certain things, but also if you look at transcriptions, then the other part is what do you do with the transcripts? So then it's, the, it's an ethical issue in how you represent people. So for instance, my first, ex my first uh, experience of giving back transcripts when I was a PhD student and I did my research in a prison with women and I did uh, where I also taught for a period of time, uh, I, did, I did their interviews and, and I did the transcripts, but I didn't want to leave the transcripts within the prison context because of people might have access to it. But I wanted to member check and I did verbatim. The first time I ever did, I did verbatim. And when I gave the transcript back, the woman I gave it to started to cry really hard. And I thought, what have I done? And oh my, as a student, you're responsible, you're trying to be ethical, you're doing all those things. And she said, I, I tried, I didn't think I had so many swear words in there. I didn't think, I tried really hard not to do that. Now that transcript to her was a representation of herself. Did I have to verbatim put in every single swear? No, it didn't add to the meeting. So, I guess I learned that lesson and took it through till now that um, you have to think about what your purpose is when you're thinking about transcribing and you have to understand how it's connected to your methodology and method okay. methods The nuts and bolts you can get to. Okay. I can imagine, um, I can imagine some people suggesting that 
if you don't attempt a verbatim transcription, if you had left out some of the um, what later became apparently unnecessary swear words, that um, you would have in some sense have corrupted your data. So let me just drag you back to yeah. data in qualitative research. Now, I, again, this is one of those things I think more attention should be given to. For me, although I won't be able to articulate it very clearly off the cuff now, data isn't necessarily what we always think it is. Data becomes data through analysis. It doesn't yes. exist independently of analysis. Does that make sense? Do you? Absolutely. Mm. It makes perfect sense. And that's why people say, oh, I have all this uh, data, you know, stored away and whatever. And I'm thinking, well, it's not data till it's analyzed. I mean, how, how do you create uh, data so, and the analysis is important. So it becomes data. Yes. When it when it enters into some sort of argument, when you can construct yeah. it or put it together in a way which makes sense within the argument of the Yes. The thing you're presenting or suggesting. Yeah. Okay. Now, some, some people might say that's semantics too. Who cares if you call that data over here uh, and it's in your drawer? It doesn't really matter. But certainly uh, one of the conundrums is students collect all this data that's never actually used in their research. And if they had been more, you know, their design had been better, they might have had more time to do some good analytic work instead of out collecting data, you know, in the world kind of thing. But the question you asked about if I leave out things from the transcript, then I'm corrupting the transcript. That only makes sense if you're coming from a positivist view. It makes no sense coming from an interpretivist paradigm and qualitative view because you know that what you've collected, whatever you represent in that transcript has already been influenced by you transcribing or you listening or you part of the conversation. So the best you can do is create a transcript that you believe best represents what was said in the conversation. And then you can give that transcript for member checking to your participant. And the participant can look at it and say, well, that's not what I meant. So as a researcher, I can say, but that's what you said, but I don't care what she said. I wanna know what she meant. That's the whole purpose of the question is for her to answer it in a meaningful way. So you have that membership check where you go into dis description. So in is my there, method, I'll, okay, go ahead. Is there a problem here of, of ideas around authenticity? That when someone says that's not what I meant, are we assuming that they have a meaning that they wish to convey in a very straightforward sense? So if I was the participant, if you had interviewed me on Monday and you asked me questions and I give you answers, you transcribe it, you come back to me a week, a fortnight, whenever later, and I say that's not what I meant, is, is that in relation to what I thought I meant on Monday or what I now think I mean? Well, I would ask for that clarification. Okay. See, the whole point is that, uh, and that's the problem with methodology chapters. Often there's very little in there about the complexities of the research process. So for instance, I would actually say to the participant, so when I asked you the question about your experience of this, this would be inaccurate to you the way it's presented in the transcript. And they will say yes or no, or they will say, since I left, I've been thinking more about it. And I realize, but for me as a researcher, my purpose of the research, if I want to draw meaning that's gonna be able to inform, you know, about my question, the more important one, the more important response might actually be the second thought to the research question, it might be more important. And that's why I always say, students say to me, oh, how many participants should I have? How many? I always say to them, sometimes the best is to have smaller numbers, which you can very credibly have, but do a double interview. Because the second interview they've left, 
They've thought about things. You have. There might be questions you didn't ask. So I would have a series of interviews with uh, a smaller number of participants. And then you can have more depth than one interview. As an interviewer, I'm sure uh, most of us know, we leave that interview saying, oh, why didn't I ask this question? It's so related. When you're doing the transcript, you know what you missed. So you make your notes. And in the second interview, you can go back to that. It can be part of the, you know, the questions for the second interview. So it's all related. Um, yeah. So I know I'm talking about a lot of things, but I find it very hard to isolate. And um, that's why a course is so good in qualitative research. If you, you know, you can talk about the intricacies and the interconnections to theory. But the most important for me is do you never abstract method from methodology. Your first thing is your methodology, your theoretical, your epistemology, what you believe about knowledge, your paradigm. Then you decide method. Okay. Um, but just to, just to clarify one point from what you're saying, I was reminded quite well the other day that when in a conversation with another person, uh, I was talking about qualitative methods stroke methodology. Yeah. And the person I was talking to reminded me that we're here looking at another spectrum and i think you mentioned this earlier that there's no such thing as qualitative inquiry that there are lots of different types of qualitative inquiry that's just an umbrella term and that mm -hmm. seems to be quite important because we do we use the phrase qualitative methods or qualitative mm -hmm. inquiry and it can it's easy to assume that there's mm -hmm. that is one thing but it's such a broad church of yes and i think you did actually... mention that earlier yeah, and actually, uh, there is now what you would consider, and there's two good papers around generic qualitative research. And what the generic would be is that you still uh, follow the criteria of the paradigm, but you're not choosing a specific tradition. Because many students claim, for instance, they're doing phenomenology, they're doing case study, they're doing, and as an external reviewer, when I look at it, I say, you haven't met the criteria of the actual tradition of ethnography. You can't claim you're doing ethnography unless you actually do ethnography. But many students at a master's level in particular are doing generic, but they're trying to fit it into a tradition because they think they have to. There is a realm. You still have criteria to meet. You still have certain practices all laid out, but it is actually called generic qualitative research. So that itself is like a, a, a tradition that has evolved, especially in student research, because they, they don't have the time to do a full-fledged case study. And they say they do case study and they do three or four interviews and you think, well, how is this case study? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I agree with what the person said, but there actually is a framework where you can do generic qualitative research as a tradition. Okay. Yeah. That's all, all right. I was saying. Sorry, did, yeah. did I interrupt your flow when I asked that, um, when I came in on that point? Uh, no, not really. Um, I've, uh, you said that I would view this after, but I'm almost going to say probably I shouldn't because I'll be very critical of how I'm jumping around. Um, but yeah, so I think the paper itself, how about we go back to there? Really interesting. It was a wonderful experience, actually. I think that's a uh, a paper that really shows the complexities far beyond what I knew when I started the research. So I think it's a good paper. It is focused on uh, focus group interviews, which some people may not do, but a lot of what's said applies, except for, let's say, the software used and things like that. But Ken, his emotional connection to the transcript, like he had a commitment to the research and that gets lost when you go out and hire people, usually just to do individual tapes for you. Uh, they're not connected to the research. And that's why it's so important for students, graduate students, to be involved in that type of work and to use it as an educational experience. So I think if you read that paper, you'll see the assumptions I'm talking about. You'll, you'll see the complexities. And you can understand that it goes beyond focus group research. It's really connected to one-on-one -on -one interviews. It's also connected to um, member checking and things, but it's not taken up in that article. 
Like, what do you do with the transcripts in to engage and to build credibility? Okay. Um, really interesting. Thank you. Lots of questions jump out from what you've said. Um, let me just bring you back finally to one to one question. Why, given the difficulties and the questions surrounding transcription, these, these questions are well known, they are well articulated. Why do you think it is that this process, this initial step in analysis doesn't receive the attention it so clearly merits? In my own field, in nursing studies, few people give the matter much concern. Mm -hmm. I find that odd. Now, you've already um, trespassed into this area, and I appreciate you can't talk to the idiosyncrasies of nursing. Nevertheless, um, briefly, is there anything else you'd like to add? Why mm -hmm. is this important aspect of analysis overlooked? Okay, so I would actually suggest it isn't well known, okay. particularly in social sciences, nursing, education. I would also say that um, it's, uh, if you take it seriously as a professor and experienced researcher, it complicates your life, really. It's costly. You have to start to question your the credibility you claim because many of us work in universities have big studies. So rather than address it, we don't. We're still, there are companies we hire to do our transcriptions. We don't even work with graduate students because they need to be trained and educated and all that. It's simpler to say in your shirk application, our big applications, I will hire a company to do the transcriptions. And you ask for money to do that. So for those who do understand, and I have colleagues that I work with, um, they, they, they understand some, many, uh, on a level, but they're not willing to move that. They're not agreeing that it's that important that they should actually do much about it. I would say for graduate students, the ones who have taken it seriously, for instance, I have a section in my course on transcription. Uh, the work I do with graduate student supervision, we talk about transcription at the design stage. So those who take it seriously, they write about it in their methodology chapter. And it so enriches. I cannot tell you how many external examiners have said, wow, the methodology chapter. I didn't think of you know, any of this in relation to transcription. So it's always strengthened the work. So I think not many people really take it up in, in social science educational context. Yes, discourse analysis and language studies, yes. Not in educational research. Uh, and we're in a neoliberal university context where who cares about meaning? We just want to get our numbers and our facts. <laughs> but if you're going to do qualitative research, meaning is central, understanding meaning. So transcription, I don't know how you ignore. Okay. But it is ignored. Okay. Once again, Dr. Tilly, really interesting. Thank you for agreeing to talk to me. And uh, links to Susan's work and the paper discussed are lodged in the notes. Dr. Tilly, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.